Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Jane Steen. Yes, we do. Yeah, so she writes historical fiction, and um, we talked to her about um, sort of a different publishing model than is um, all the rage right now. It's more like a slow and steady Mm -hmm. publishing model where she writes, she takes her time with her books, and she gets them out, and Mm -hmm. it's nice to talk to someone who's uh, very uh, content with that. She's very Mm -hmm. happy with that publishing model, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed the interview. Jane's very smart and, um, she's from England. So it's lovely to hear her accent and, uh, but yeah, she's, she's really smart and she just, um, she kind of has her way of doing it and she just sticks to Mm -hmm. it. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And we talked about recovering, uh, books. Uh, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a series that she recovered and did a completely different, um, uh, kind of style of cover mm-hmm. and I've talked about how she did that and how she came and how that went and um, mm-hmm. a lot of good information in there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, let's see. Oh, we talked about permit-free books too, yes. which is always an interesting topic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. People on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good topic though. So what's been going on with you? Well, this week um, I had, I have a lot of things coming up and I spent this week doing research and cleaning out like my email and getting caught up on all these mm-hmm. little nitnoid projects that I've had that I just thought if I can just kind of like clear the decks, mm-hmm. then um, when I, I'm going out of town and when I get back, then I can hopefully dive into mm-hmm. writing and get back at mm-hmm. it and um, uh, painted some French doors. Like I'm still doing stuff around the house, getting mm-hmm. things done, mm-hmm. uh, getting kids settled for semesters that are starting and things like that. So I don't know. It's just you know, I don't, I don't work well if I'm not in my routine. So Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get everything finished off so I can start afresh, I guess, in (laughs) mid-September. Yeah. What about you? That's awesome. Um, I am getting ready for this launch. You know, it's just all the little things I've got my list and I'm checking things off. And, um, I did decide this time not to do a good reads giveaway. So I'll let everybody know, uh, that cause it's on my launch plan that, and I have done them the last couple of times, but I had a little trouble. My, um, um, cover designer was a little backed up and I didn't get the paperback cover until mm-hmm. just this week. And so by the time I got it up, it would have only been a two week um, giveaway because I like them to end on the day the book releases so that everybody gets an email. Yeah. Um, if the only, the only way to kind of circumvent that is to do the more expensive giveaway. And I don't, I don't really want to do that because it's mm-hmm. not just a little bit more expensive. It's a lot more expensive. Yeah. And um so I decided not to do it. So I'm not. Um, and that might have been a mistake, but I don't know. Uh, I've had a free <laughs> book this week. The last book in my bride series was this week. And it's been really interesting. I have not really pushed it like I normally do, but I did have paid new le- newsletters almost every day. Um, a couple of big ones and then some little ones. Monday, I had e-reader news today Mm -hmm. and, um, that one, I mean, e-reader news today and free booksy. And I got, I don't like 3000 downloads. I thought that was pretty good. It's already been free before. So I was pretty happy with that. Um, and so for the week I got a little over 8,000. Not, I like to get 10,000, so I'm a little short, but honestly, I didn't, like I didn't really, Friday, I finally pushed it in some people's groups. I just was kind of like, well, here's my free book. I will say though, that Red Feather, um, I did them this time for the first time, not great um, for my book. I think yeah. my book, 
my books are spicy. I mean, they have sex on the page, but the covers do not reflect that. Maybe, Mm -hmm. I don't know, but yeah, didn't, that wasn't as good as like the free books he was since they're both written word media Um, book raid. I will say that one was a pretty good one. So that one you get charged per click they charge you per click but it, there's a it's a discounted rate of clicks mm-hmm. like i had 780 clicks and so i paid 60 dollars. Mm-hmm. i thought that was okay not great but i got they said i got 380 for free so which means it, i know i don't know i don't i gotta go in and look at that but that one was pretty good i didn't i mean 60 dollars is a lot but it's not like you know 150 dollars, and right. i got 780 clicks. So I was pretty happy with that. I hadn't used that one before. I'm not sure I'll do it again, but I might because I was pretty happy because that day was not, I didn't have anything else going that day. And my book dropped in rank uh, about 10 or 20 places, you know? So I stayed anywhere from 25 in the store to 50 in the store. Mm -hmm. And then one day I didn't have anything and it went to 97 and then dropped back down to in the 50s. So I was happy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that when you're doing those smaller newsletters, I think it's important to try different ones Yeah. because yeah. Um, there have been some that I've tried that just really didn't do anything at all. And then there's others that have been great. Mm-hmm. And it seems like there's different ones and new ones that right. pop up. And um, some of them I've tried that didn't work you know, maybe five years ago, I should go back and give them another try, you yeah. know, just to see, yeah. cause I think their subscriber right. list change they because like change. I've tried, um, free booksy and it was not worth it at all for me, but mm-hmm. that was probably six years ago. So mm-hmm. I probably should give it another go and see. Yeah. Yeah. How I does. mean, I've gotten as many as like just on free booksy, like almost 5,000 downloads. Like the first time I ran a free Mm-hmm. anything on there uh it was pretty awesome but you know of course every time you run it and i don't run mine very often but every time you run them it's you know you get fewer downloads mm-hmm. um but yeah i mean so maybe some people that are listening going man that was a bust or i wouldn't have paid that for that whatever i mean you know i just try to look at new things i'm always trying to try different things and see if, if they work and if they don't work. So if yeah, you don't think that sounds like a good deal, then you can avoid book rate or any of the others because yeah. I've done the work for you. So there That's you right. go. That's <laughs> right. And it's like, I think we're a little spoiled in the author community because mm-hmm. we expect a return on advertising and there's mm-hmm. lots and we expect a pretty high return really, mm-hmm. honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, companies that would be thrilled to get yeah. you know what we yeah. get for a sale or you know like the yeah. the most companies big companies you know they pay and they just are working on brand awareness or mm-hmm. things like that they're not focusing on sales sometimes and so yeah, yeah. so i think we're so, the ability to track things now has given right. us the ability to to know whether or not it's paying off which is great but then right. it's also made us our expectations very high on right. you know and right Sometimes, you know, that saying about they have people have to see your product like up to seven times sometimes. Right. Right. And um, one last thing that I did that I haven't done before, usually when I run a free, I just push people to the next book. Well, because this was the last book in the series, um, I did, I pushed them to book one because I, I know that there might be some people that were. Mm -hmm. new readers and, you know, and then, but then, so I did that. I put a little thing in a link and here, if you want to, or keep reading, keep reading. And Mm -hmm. then if you want to, but then I brought below that, I also said, if you've read my bride series, you know, and you want to, you still want the, whatever I said, something fun or whatever, um, then you can read, you can go on, keep reading to read the first chapter of homecoming King. So I put both of them there. Usually I don't do that, but I did this time because it, it's a weird little thing. And I'd already scheduled this 
when I realized that I was going to have a release coming up, you know, so I was like, well, I'll just see how this works. So, so far it's worked. Uh, actually the, the rank on book one has dropped uh, or improved and the book on homecoming King has, I mean, the rank on homecoming King has improved. So, uh, hopefully that'll continue. So that's good. And my page reads are going up. Yeah. Yeah. And then last thing, Oh gosh, I said, I didn't have anything going on and I'm talking, <laughs> um, TikTok. I'm working on my TikTok. Don't stop. Uh, so I, um, if you want to check me out there, I try to do funny stuff and trying to do my book stuff. I took a TikTok class. We can talk about that another time. Uh, it was good. It was a great class. I really love it because they have a lot of support with it, but we can talk about that next time or whenever. Yeah. Uh, but it was really, um, it's been helpful. It's kind of been enlightening about mm-hmm. how you should post, when you should post, not really when, but like how many times you should post and mm-hmm. who you should target. So it's all, all pretty interesting. So cool. anyway, Sounds I'm good. Jamie Albright author on there. So if y'all want to check me out, check me out there. Cool. And that's so, it. I'm not on TikTok. I've <laughs> just maxed out on social media platforms. So I'm not you know, on there, it, but go find does, Jamie. It does suit me. Yeah. I, for me, I don't know that it sells books. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it does right now. I'm hoping to find an audience. My audience is not on there or like my current audience is not on there. I'm hoping to find audit, but, but they really love very spicy books, very spicy books. My books are not very spicy. They're spicy. But they're not very spicy, but they love very spicy books. They love dark romance and they love YA and fantasy romance. So um, I don't fall in those categories, but I have to believe there are some people that just want a fun rom-com with a little spice in it. So, um, but it does suit me as far as a medium goes, because it can, it just gives me a chance to be creative in a different way. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't take a lot of time. If it, when it starts taking too much time, I'll, ha- I'll back off. But uh, right now, because I don't have a, I'm not writing, it's kind of not been a problem. Not so. as stressful. Yeah. Trying mm-hmm. to do that right. and get the words in. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, all that to say, I've been kind of busy this week, but not much. <laughs> so. Anyway, and my book comes out September 17th. So nice. I'm excited. Yeah. Arcs mm-hmm. go out tomorrow. And yeah, well, actually, it's Tuesday, today, Saturday, so they'll go out tomorrow and Monday. So mm-hmm. uh, by the time this comes out, they'll be out. So I'm a little bit nervous about that, but aren't we all? We aren't are, we I, all? Yes, the very <laughs> just typically the typical feelings, like the roller coaster that you go I through. Know. I'm so happy to be finished. Oh my goodness, I'm so. I've got to write a blurb. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's that the the elation of being finished, and then the crash of oh my gosh i've got to write a blurb that's right yeah yeah so it's all come together you know it always does but we should probably get on with the interview because jane has some great things to say and uh i'm rambling so there you go okay well but should we do (laughs) a question of the week oh yes oh shoot y'all always forget this (laughs) i need this i need an agenda (laughs) Um, so we should say maybe something about like um have you about your publishing goals or schedule? Because we talk about that a lot, or maybe yeah. about recovering books. Mm, let's do. How do you determine your publishing schedule? Like, what factors go into your publishing schedule? That's like how many question. books? What about the, I don't, yeah. I'm not sure. I may. I may. We may it edit better it. after <laughs> I get off this thing and I can think about it but yeah I, I th- I'm interested in that like what factors go into how many books you decide you're going to write a year and you know yeah that, that sounds good yeah let's see yeah that. Okay. yeah it reminds me of I, I worked in an office one time and they put out a magazine and somebody asked they said how does that magazine go out and they want to know does it go out in like print e mm-hmm. digital whatever and the person who was the editor was like it goes out in a panic 
So I feel like a lot of us, like, <laughs> like we choose our, you know, our schedule. We're just like, ah, I need to do X number of books. Yeah. You know, this so. is my soulmate. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. All right. Well, very so, good. Yes. So tell us in the group and here is Jane. Okay. Today we are really excited to have Jane Steen with us. How are you, Jane? I'm very well. Thanks. Very pleased to be here. Oh, thank you for being here and for staying up late. You're in the UK. Isn't that correct? Yeah, but it's only like 9 p.m., oh, well, so it's bad. not very late. For, for a party animal like you, not too bad. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> well, here, let me read your bio. Jane Steen writes for readers who love a series you can't put down. She blends saga, mystery, adventure, and a touch of romance set against the background of real-life issues facing women in the late 19th century. Oh, well, that's great. I love that bio. Um, so tell us how you got into writing, Jane. Uh, actually, I've done writing um, in many, many jobs. So I guess I sort of um, cut my teeth on all kinds of writing when I was younger and in corporate jobs or you know, I ended up doing all sorts of things. I ended up doing um, uh, like reporting on committee meetings and stuff like that. Um, I did a, a whole bunch of translating at one point in my life uh, when I was living in Belgium. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. I, I started to be recruited into jobs for my writing ability and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was something I did, but I never really thought of writing fiction. And then in 2009, I ended up um, without a job for the time being and uh, because there'd been a kind of a situation which had got kind of toxic and I just you know decided I had enough of it and I at that point it didn't even occur to me that I want to write fiction I guess but I had this real burst of creativity at the time and one of the things that I did was I had this story in my head and I thought, well, it'd be fun to actually try mm-hmm. um, writing fiction just to see what it was like. Right. And I discovered that I really liked it. And mm-hmm. I never actually published that book. It's still sitting on my hard drive because <laughs> I realized, well, I realized, you know, I wrote this, you know, what I kind of a novel, a draft mm-hmm. of a novel. And when I started editing it, I realized that, uh, yeah, I could write, but I really didn't know much about writing novels. Mm-hmm. So the next book, I I actually tried harder. I kind of learned something about story Mm -hmm. structure and Mm -hmm. so forth. And when I'd finished that one, that was The House of Closed Doors. And I thought, well, you know what? People might actually like to read this. Mm -hmm. And self-publishing was really, this was by 2010, self-publishing was starting to become uh, respectable. And Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of people doing it. It was starting to sound like fun. And I made the decision at that point that I did not want to pursue a traditional um, publication path. So I went for self-publishing and just never looked back. Never looked back. So what what things did you do to teach yourself to write or to learn to write or, you know, to write a novel? Not learn to write necessarily, but to learn to write a novel. I read advice. I read books. Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. studied some plotting methods. I just dove into all the information that was already there at that mm-hmm. point, uh, I think now there's 10 times mm-hmm. as much information. Yeah. But even back then, if you look at, were looking for it, mm-hmm. there were plenty of people willing to give advice or there were plenty of good books out there. Mm-hmm. And um, I already had a pretty good idea of what a good story looked like mm-hmm. because obviously, like most writers, I've been a reader. Been a reader, yeah. Since, yeah. you know, since I was a very small child. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I knew what kind of story I wanted to read. Mm -hmm. And I just tried to write that. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. You didn't have to pick up um, Writing Romance for Dummies, did you? Because that's the one I read. Oh, no, that sounds um, wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds awesome. No, I wish I'd done that. Then maybe I'd be a romance writer, (laughs) which would actually be a lot of fun. I mean, obviously, all my books do have elements of romance in them. And I think Mm -hmm. many good books do yeah yeah um and so but i mostly sort of write in the sort of mystery genre yes, yeah. sort of yes. yeah. yeah and yours are mostly historical right right yeah yes because i'm fascinated by the late victorian period 
um, have been actually since my teens, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, a period where I've read a lot of books about the period and I've read a lot of books written in the period. And so it comes very naturally to me to write about that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you already had some of the background knowledge for that yeah. period, that sounds like. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's your definition of success? Mm -hmm. um, I think success is when you are sufficiently challenged by what you're doing, when you're getting sufficient out of it. And that could be money or it could be satisfaction, or it, you know, it, it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel successful in that um, I've been able to get my books out to a lot of readers. Um, I feel happy with what I'm producing. Um, and I, I, I have this sort of this life as, as now as, as an established author. And to me, that's success. It doesn't have to be a certain number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Because that is true. You know, I mean, you just have to sit around, but to be an established author, that just, that's a good feeling to know yeah. you've, you've worked that, that was my, hard. My, yeah. One of my proudest moments was actually when I put a new book out and somebody said, oh, you know, a new series from an established author. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's there me. <laughs> Oh, and nice it was so nice to, to hear that. From, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it has so nice to hear that from a reader. Right. Yes. Um, right. And obviously, this was a um, you know an influential reader, an influencer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. So we talked about this a little bit, but I think you probably have even more to tell us. Uh, but what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started writing? Oh, I wish I had studied plot and story structure better mm -hmm. from the beginning. Yeah. I wish I'd been one of those readers or writers, which I'm still not, that will sit there with somebody else's novel and just analyze it. I know. I've seen people do that, and I think that is genius, but I've never yeah. done it. I just can't. <laughs> it ruins the story for me if I do it. So mm. It does, and, you know, I'm still... Um, a somewhat a discovery writer or mm -hmm. pantser. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, you know, I do try and give myself some kind of a structure to begin with when I'm starting a new novel. I'll give myself some kind of structure. I'll look at the main things, you know, the inciting mm -hmm. incident and the midpoint and the, you know, where the, the, the um, climax of the novel and try and figure that out because otherwise what I found right in the beginning was that I would, get to I, I go too fast mm -hmm. I get to to sort of three quarters through the novel by about you know 30,000 words or something like that it just didn't work the timeline mm -hmm. didn't work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. do you um like do you write it all down how do you do that I think people would be curious if you're a discovery writer do you just have it all in your head and you start you're like your start or do you have anything written down I usually have various notes and things. And as time goes on, I'm appreciating more and more the value of preparing mm -hmm. to write. So writing about the characters, especially new characters, mm -hmm. and, and trying to figure out some key scenes and so forth. So, and, and, you know, obviously doing the research because it's historical background and so forth. So I'll look into what's happening in those years so that I'm not ignoring something really important. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a vague kind of floaty kind mm -hmm. of process that I'm, I go through. <laughs> yeah, Hard I to heard, describe. Yeah. I heard one author talk about she wrote sticky notes down and threw them in a bowl on her table, kitchen table or something, and walked by them for a couple of weeks. And she said, and then eventually those sticky notes begin to commune. <laughs> and then they kept together in a story. <laughs> Sometimes it feels Yeah, like I that. don't really use sticky notes, but I do use um, um, notebooks and Scrivener mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of different things when I'm just trying to pull the elements of a story mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, what about Sometimes Martin? even a spreadsheet or, you know, yeah. something yeah. like that. I mean, I worked out my, my latest series – I have actually worked out, it's a seven book series, and I have worked out the main plot lines of that. Wow. Which has been a huge help. Mm -hmm. My first, yeah. the first series that I wrote has been much sort of vaguer mm -hmm. and much more of a discovery thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about that? Oh, um, I wish I wish that I understood some of the creative sides of marketing better. I feel like that's my weakness. Mm -hmm. I really admire authors who can just kind of put a great ad together. With the copy and the and the, and the images and so forth, and I kind of wish I had studied that side mm -hmm. of marketing better, or e or even content marketing. You know, just getting out there and writing great articles and so forth. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you do much um, many ads, or are you more just focusing on the books? Um, I have done quite a lot of ads I've done a lot of experimenting with ads and I find that actually what I do best with are the Amazon ads and I think that's because that's far more of a mechanical process in in a sense um, you set it up you let it run you see mm -hmm. how it's going you go back to it you don't have to do that sort of creative mm -hmm. slippery stuff of trying to find where you're best targeting things i tend to set up amazon ads that just run pretty much I, i do the auto ads with no with no copy it just works better for me because mm -hmm. like i say i'm weaker on the i think i'm weaker on the creative side yeah yeah um, so an automated process that will just figure out its own thing <laughs> makes a lot of sense to me and then i can mm -hmm. get into the spreadsheets and see what see what it's doing and i think yes i i totally understand that because that's a machine mm -hmm. just, right Right. And they know, you know, I mean, Amazon knows yeah. who wants your book and who, you know, if you've, if you've set it up the right way, as far as keywords and it's already been served to the right people, they're just going to keep finding mm -hmm. those people to serve it to in yeah. theory, but yeah. it, the best so, ads run that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand pretty well. And I've tried book by buyers, for example, which um, you need a lot more creative input and I just don't do very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need, I need a different brain mm -hmm. to really do those. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, it, it's the area which I really want to work harder. Yeah. What assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and have they turned out to be rather wrong? I really don't think I had many assumptions. I, oh, I don't good. think I had very um, great expectations. I, I, I was just focused on the challenge with the first yeah. book. You know, the first book was the challenge was write the book, mm -hmm. write a decent book. And then the next challenge was publish it on Amazon. You know, so mm -hmm. you start with one format, ebook, one place, Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so each time it's been just like, okay, what's the next challenge? Mm -hmm. Um, and I have just really focused on what's in front of me rather than uh, assume that, you know, anything's going to go a particular way. Well, that's very healthy of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I had such a healthy view. Now, are you wide or are you in KU? wide all the, wide. The way. all the way yes. wide wide I, for the win yes yes <laughs> i had a 90 day flirtation with um um ku mm -hmm. in about 2015 i mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. and it just wasn't for me yeah no and and your books are really they are much more mar uh, marketable to a wide audience i think mm -hmm. the mystery and things like yeah. that yeah i think well, we like so we like to talk about um, like lessons learned and um, a lot of people don't like the word mistake, but um, mm -hmm. have you ever had something that you thought um, looking back, you go, mm, that was not, that was kind of a mistake, not, but it turned out to be okay. Like at the time you thought, Oh, this is not great. But then it turned out to be okay later. I think most of my mistakes have just been mistakes. <laughs> um, they haven't <laughs> resulted in anything unexpected. <laughs> they were just, okay. Um, I should try this another way. That wasn't quite right. I'll try mm -hmm. this another way. Mm -hmm. And I just would move forward and mm -hmm. say, okay, that was a mistake. And then sometimes, you know, I, like you do, you lose money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you say, well, that was dumb. And mm -hmm. that's it. You just move on to the next thing. Right. Yeah. Now, are you going. actually that pragmatic about it? I mean, do you, or do you have to have a, a t time of licking your wounds, so to speak, and then you move on? Um, 
funnily enough, I think it's because I'm the boss of this outfit. Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. actually rarely have that uh, experience since I've started doing this whole writing and publishing thing right. of of being upset about something. I mean, I used to go away and you know, sulk for half a day about yeah. something and then <laughs> I'd come back. But I think it's because it's my business mm-hmm. um, and I'm not, you know, in corporate you are subject to all these pressures and egos and things, mm-hmm. all this stuff with other people, mm-hmm. and you're far more likely to get the kind of wound where you have to go and, away for a bit. Right. Um, I think I've just been really happy being my own boss. That's great. What about the opposite? Have you ever had uh, an idea or thought that you feel this is brilliant, this is going to do everything I want it to do, and then it turned out not to work? I think that's usually how you start on any new shiny new thing yeah <laughs> that everybody else says is the best thing for them right and you know like type various forms of advertising and mm-hmm. so forth and you think oh yeah this is really going to work this is going to make me a fortune and then in the end you realize that the other person made a fortune because they already had all these fundamentals in place right 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 and, and and so you know many of the people, many of the gurus and so forth, whose courses I have bought, mm. uh, I have spent much money on other people's courses, and really found that the lesson is that they were doing things that I wasn't doing, mm. and that if I wanted to follow their path, I would have to do these things. They weren't always what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to say, the first, the most, um, the best course that I ever found, the best thing I ever found was BookBub. Mm. I'm a huge mm-hmm. fan. Mm. Yeah. In <laughs> they they can really shoot you to the stratosphere and help you find yeah. the exact mm-hmm. readers that you need, right? Yeah. And, it was, and it was it was the per, it, it was starting um uh having a perma free first in mm-hmm. series. Mm-hmm. That and then combining that with book clubs and other kinds of uh, promotions and advertising that just really exploded things for me because plenty of people wanted to come back and then read the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. Right. And do you still have a permafree? Do you still I do, do permafree? I do. Yeah. And I'm 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 gonna I think eventually have two. I'll have two first in series. <laughs> yeah. Because um I love that I, I like the generosity of it. I really yeah. enjoy putting a book into people's hands mm-hmm. and saying, well it's you know it's free. Mm-hmm. Give it a try. If you don't like it, you've lost yeah. nothing. Mm-hmm. Yes. It makes and it really it's, easy to say, here you go, you know. Yeah. Give it, it a go. It does. <laughs> and it makes it easier to advertise. Um, and it's just um, yeah, it's the free sample. I mean, I'd, mm-hmm. if I were manufacturing something, I'd be standing uh in, in London, you know, on in the stations, or certainly pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you're walking through the main stations, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people just going through there. And you get people handing out samples of whatever, you know, mm-hmm. candy or something like that mm-hmm. to all these commuters. And um, because it works. And I feel the same way that I would be, I'm sort of virtually standing there with all these people going by mm-hmm. and just saying, you know, hey, try this. Have a free yeah. book. Do you like to read? Here's a book. Do you yeah. like to read? Yeah. And it's a book. I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> It's pretty benign. It's not like you're trying to give them something they don't need or want. It's just exactly. a book, and I think that that's, uh, I think that's great. I, w- I, w- I do think that if I ever went wide, that would definitely be my strategy because yeah. I do yeah. believe it works. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think and- KU. I mean, I'm actually been experimenting as a reader with mm-hmm. KU, and mm-hmm. and you know, just giving it a go. Mm-hmm. And I must admit, there's a lot of power in saying, okay, well, this is not going to cost me anything, anything more Yeah. to, I may as well take a look at this book. Right. right. And yeah. And, and then I find that if, especially when I'm researching things, mm-hmm. um, I, I'm finding a lot of books on the subjects that I was particularly interested in. And if I like them, I buy them anyway. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that I will still have my notes and highlights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's a very powerful um, way of going about uh, just getting your name out there. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, what about um, mindset? Have you had to go through any uh, big mindset shifts? 
Yeah, uh, the big one is that I am a publisher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start out, you think of yourself that you're you're the writer. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I didn't really think until almost quite recently that the moment I first put that first book up on on the Kindle, I was a publisher. Mm -hmm. And now more and more I'm trying to think like a publisher and really separate the publisher self from the writer self. And say, you know, the publisher has to do these actions Mm -hmm. and many of them, you know, I'm not doing. And then, you know, I'm at this point where I'm sort of like, I need other people to help me with these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to delegate tasks Mm -hmm. to people. And but they need to be done. And I'm not always doing them Mm -hmm. because when I start, when I get into a writing period, which I'm in right now because I'm on the second draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is really, really hard to at the same time doing the publishing stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm learning to say to myself, okay, once I finish this and I you know, can do production there, but then I have to do these other business tasks or teach somebody to do them. Right. And I find that they're not even hard tasks, but they take time. And take time. I sometimes, I just don't have the time or I, I don't have the mental capacity to switch lanes or switch yeah. gears. and start doing admin stuff sometimes when, you know, I've been writing or I'm, you know, like right now I'm editing. And so, you know, all my energy is going towards that and making the edits that my editor gave me the best they can be. And so yeah, it's really that's tricky. exactly yeah. it. Yeah. That is the problem. And mm-hmm. we, you know, it's hard to switch off that part of your brain when that's what you've been doing mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. the entire day month Mm -hmm. or whatever I mean you know for me it's um for a rewrite like this it's going to be Mm -hmm. a couple of months and that's working pretty hard at it and that's all my creative energy is kind of going there Mm -hmm. right now well you are uh, similar to me in that you take your time with your books and um you you haven't fallen into that publish fast sort of um lane and I wanted to talk to you about that. Like, what is that just your process or did you make a conscious effort not to do that? Uh, for me, I don't think I have a choice. It just sort of comes when it comes. But mm-hmm. um, I, I just didn't know how you're, how it is for you. I honestly think that if I tried to do that, I would just die. I would become a nervous wreck. I'd have a nervous breakdown or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a lot of responsibilities, a lot going on outside my writing business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, those are things that um, obviously sort of family ties and so mm-hmm. forth. Those are responsibilities that I'm very happy to um, to have. Mm-hmm. And it's just part of my life. Mm-hmm. And then also there are other things that I do. And my mm-hmm. hobby is gardening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I spend like a solid afternoon at the weekend just doing that and mm-hmm. everything else gets switched off. Mm-hmm. So, and things like that, you know, and then I have a little volunteering that I do mm-hmm. and I, I can't, I, I just simply couldn't tie myself to this desk. Mm-hmm all the time so and I I can't write I I can't just write a first draft tweak it and then put it out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really uh, the the book needs to be right for me artistically before it goes out Mm -hmm. and I don't say I'm absolutely um crazy or perfectionist about it Mm -hmm. I don't overwork I'm not one of those people that does 14 drafts I'll do a first draft and a rewrite Mm -hmm. and then you know maybe some tweaking and then a beta read and then some more tweaking and then it's pretty much done but um I couldn't just Mm -hmm. write the story okay that was it do a bit of editing right right well and and then you've got research on top of that so, well, yes, uh, yes. I'm not very good at research, actually. People say, <laughs> I mean, people write to me and say, oh, everything is so, you know, accurate and, and so forth. And I think, well, actually, no, I made this howler in this book and this howler. And, you know, very occasionally somebody spots it, and it's very occasionally, mm-hmm. and writes in. 
And I've had to say, yep, sorry, I uh, I just got that wrong. Mm-hmm. I must have. Uh, and usually it's based on something that I've read. Mm-hmm. And I don't I don't, you know, go back to the primary sources or anything like that. I just read books. Right. And I research interesting things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because I've been reading about this era since I was a teenager, I, I kind of I do know a fair amount and I've mm-hmm. got a good feel for the way things are. Mm-hmm. but I'm no historian. And I say mm-hmm. that in every author's note. Yeah. I am not a historian. I am a storyteller. Right. Yes. And what drew you to this era of, you know, of writing? I was, something- do- I was doomed to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was at school and mm. I was doing A-level English, so, you know, in, in England you kind of focus more on, on um, two or three subjects mm-hmm. uh, towards the end of your high school life. Um, so one of them was English. And I wanted to do early 20th century. I was in my D.H. Lawrence phase. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, we did the Victorians. And I really resented that at first. But by the time I'd done, you know, been reading the Victorians for a couple of years, mm-hmm. I was really interested. And mm-hmm. I was interested, even back then, I was very interested in the way life was for women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the differences um, and, you know, and the differences and the similarities. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I was also, you know, I, you get interested in in, in the um, other things, you know, the fact that um, there's less technology. The technology that's there is very different. Mm-hmm. People, women certainly dress differently. Right. Um, they had all this hair that they had to deal mm-hmm. with. Um <laughs> And all the rest of it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I just got really interested in it, and that never went away. Mm. So I was just doomed. And <laughs> also, um, I, mean, I was doomed from from a child childhood actually because um, my m- we had a a bookshelf for the children. We didn't. I didn't grow up in a household where there was a lot of reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, my parents were children during the war, and I think missed uh, you know a certain amount of schooling. Um, during that time and Mm -hmm. they they were not big readers but we had a children's bookshelf and somebody had bought sort of abridged children's versions of the classics Mm -hmm. so one of the early books I remember reading was Jane Eyre oh yeah yeah and that was the first one where you know just, just as a child I was really sort of oh wow this is so sort of thrilling and exciting (laughs) and uh, I was amazed when I was about 16 I checked the book out the library and I read the actual full (laughs) adult version and there was more yeah (laughs) you know it's like it wasn't just what I the story I knew there was more of it it was more complex yes so funny that's great that's great yeah yeah Yeah, I think there's a debate about like should you give kids the abridged classics but I think if you really love a story then you're just happy when you find yes. out, oh, that was the short version, and now I can read the full version. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yes, I, I, my answer to that would be yes. Give them the abridged um, classic mm-hmm. because uh, it's too complex for them to go into yeah. uh, anything too difficult. Yeah. And I really applaud people who can abridge um, yeah. complex works for other people, and you know, not just children for special needs people. My uh, oldest daughter. Um, is cognitively disabled. So, you know, I really see the value yeah. yes. of, of bringing literature to everybody, no matter mm-hmm. what the level of understanding. Right, right. Well, I want to go back quickly to your, um, like, you seem you publish in a in a pace that you seem very happy with, and you don't feel, mm-hmm. you don't seem to feel the pressure that a lot of writers feel to produce quickly. Mm-hmm. And I wondered, how do, do you get questions from your readers mm-hmm. about like, when will the next book be? Cause I feel like there's a beginning to be a culture that books should be coming out more quickly. Yeah. And how do you respond to that? They write to me constantly saying, you know, good. when's the next the book? Good I really yeah, yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful. It is pressure. But I just say, you know, okay, this is what I'm working on right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm hoping to get it out. By, but I always say I can't promise that the okay. book's going to be out by a certain date because it's, it's got to be right. Like I say, I'm not perfectionist. It doesn't have to be perfect. I, right. I don't think any writer, when they actually release a book, 
think, you know, this is the most perfect book. Right. You always think, oh, you know, I had this vision in my head and I could have done better with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, if it's been through my reading team and people like the story, then I think, okay, you know, people are going to like the story. And that's the main thing. It will entertain them. And that's what it's all about. That's great. Yeah. I actually have a really good quote um, <laughs> from David Gochran, who you no doubt know. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I, I put this on a sticky note. I very rarely do oh, sticky good. notes. But I put this on a sti- sticky note because I thought it was so relevant to what I knew our conversation was going to be. If you are steadfast in your desire not to kowtow to the market in any way, to make absolutely no compromises to your artistic vision, perhaps factor that into your sales expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's for all the the literary writers and the perfectionist writers um, that you will get out of the market what you put into it. So if you meet its expectation the more you meet its expectations the more Mm -hmm. you're going to sell those books Mm -hmm. and sometimes meeting its expectations actually does mean um sacrificing a little bit on quality Mm -hmm. one of the things that happens with me is I tend to use long words Mm -hmm. and sometimes my readers my first reader my beta readers and so forth will say um you know using so many long words and I said I just can't dumb it down it's not Mm -hmm. me (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> it sounds to me like you want to be happy with your books like you yeah. want them at a point where you're happy to release them right. and then then you can move on which that right. makes yeah. perfect sense I, I, I want a book that I would be happy to read mm-hmm. yeah and I do uh, when I have to reread to remind myself of what happened in a book um, you know because I'm doing series so mm-hmm. kind of you do have to try and remember what you wrote uh, then I'm generally I'm pretty happy and especially as I tend to forget what I wrote so I'll go back yeah. and I'll read it and I'll say oh actually this is pretty good yeah <laughs> uh, and I'm enjoying reading this and, and if you can enjoy yourself as a reader <clears throat> then other readers are going to enjoy you as well because I'm not a, a particularly unusual reader mm-hmm. I like right. the things that other people like I mm-hmm. tend to be a little more critical sometimes than some right. but yeah 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 well, I think that's very true. It's very good. Uh-huh. We love quotes from David Gogren. So that yes. was good. <laughs> yeah, he's I, I read his emails yes. you know, religiously. Yes, yeah, um, too. He does make a lot of sense. And, yeah. you know, obviously, as you know, he's a, also a great guy to mm-hmm. um, sort of hang out with personally yes, he is. and talk about the business. <laughs> yep. Well, so we also wanted to ask you about your cover rebrand that you mm-hmm. did for the House of Closed mm-hmm. Doors series. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us? Um, how you came to realize you wanted to rebrand them and how the process went. Yeah, um, my original covers were, you know, that kind of historical fiction thing where you have a woman dressed in period costume Mm -hmm. looking away from, um, you know, uh, so you're seeing sort of the back of her head Mm -hmm. into a Victorian type background. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really worked at the beginning. And I actually had custom photography, which uh, at the first book it was just fell into. Mm -hmm. I happened to have a friend who it was and still is a book cover photographer. Mm. Um, And she she did the first cover for me. And it just it was just so easy and seamless and so forth. And the cover worked really well. And then the next couple of ones, I she wasn't she she had moved and mm-hmm. um, she wasn't doing exactly that kind of thing anymore, and so I kind of did it with my designer, but it wasn't as comfortable. And also for the fourth book in that series, I knew that you know that the story had moved on, and I was going to have to introduce another human element into the story, <laughs> into the cover, mm-hmm. um, to make sense of it, and I just didn't want to do that it would have been so difficult to find stock photography that would have worked Mm -hmm. um I'd moved countries and so you know the whole setup that I'd had where I could get somebody to do some photography for me just wasn't going to work anymore Mm -hmm. and I realized anyway that I just wanted to do something a little different I wanted something that was less historical fiction maybe hinted a little more mystery but didn't really 
brand brand it too strongly within a particular genre or particular mm-hmm. subgenre um, because it kind of I found that I attracted different types of readers. Mm-hmm. And so um, my uh, current designer is Rachel Lawson, who's absolutely wonderful. And I went to her and I said, you know, I want to rebrand the covers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked about it and she came up with some great designs. And yeah, so I was and I, we we kind of looked at um, what was happening in covers at that point, which was a couple of years ago. Um, so in the kind of the mystery and the historical mystery, so forth. And there were some fun things that were happening that were a bit more abstract. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's been happening with self-publishing, um, with indie publishing, just becoming such a thing, is that people have moved away from those comp- sort of complicated custom setups mm-hmm. more. Yes. And, they've, and covers have become a little more abstract again. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just a sign of the times, you know, that, that mm-hmm. there's um, different styles coming in. Anyway, we got kind of excited about that and, and Rachel came up with some great designs. And um, then I didn't, I sat on them for a long mm-hmm. time <laughs> because I was having an amazing year with advertising and, you know, I, was sort of like, I don't want to change the covers while things are doing so well. I don't want to jinx myself. Um, but then I came to a point where I was like, okay, now I have to do it because the fourth book's coming out. Right. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to change the covers. And it really wasn't that painful when it came to it. And it didn't make a huge difference in the sales. Mm-hmm. I think um, by that time, you know, I, I people knew me enough. And right. I don't know, everybody just seemed to take it in the stride. I, I didn't really get any people saying, oh, we really missed the old covers and so forth. Um, what happened uh, mostly was that um, I, I felt I was almost able to position the book slightly differently, mm-hmm. and that that was good. That's great. Yeah, yeah I yeah. Think- go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was just going to say that I think the the newer covers they're um, more um, font based. Te- mm-hmm. like they're more text based and i think yeah. that um to me it seems like they're more um like they could be mystery they could be so i think i can see how it would bring in new readers that maybe wouldn't have picked up the other books maybe they'll pick those up from a different genre that maybe wouldn't have picked up a historical yeah. mystery do yeah. you think maybe yeah. yeah i think so and i mean one of my writer friends said oh they look more literary mm-hmm. um but that really wasn't my intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm still, you know, I'm a genre writer. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel that they work. Mm-hmm. I feel very um, happy and pleased with them every time I see them mm-hmm. in a store or whatever. And I like the fact that I have these two series which are branded quite differently because my second series, uh, The Scott Quincy Mysteries, is is a different kind of brand that's more the kind of um the clip art type cover mm-hmm. with but with a beautiful border and so forth mm-hmm. and I just love what Rachel put together mm-hmm. um for me there and you know this the second book um, is the one I'm working on and we've already got the cover design done mm-hmm. and that's very similar to the mm-hmm. first book so it's going to be very very strongly band- branded mm-hmm. all seven books yeah, that's great. And um, that's, you know, I, I feel that that is going to work for me. And I, I think of, um, you know, like the Outlander series, of which I'm very fond, mm-hmm. which has these covers with just this symbol in the middle, mm-hmm. you know, which absolutely means nothing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, immediately you look at that and you say, you know, that's that's an Outlander book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they're branded within the within their notoriety and their um series and it's sort of what we've said all along is you, you can break the rules but you really know, need to know the rules before you break the rules yeah because because you didn't go completely out on the other side you just made a slight pivot and now you you're bringing in other readers and I think that's great I think that's yeah. just really smart well that's- I also I did it with the um huge input of a, a, a designer who's very very experienced yes in designing covers, uh, book covers, and really understands what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. And if you get somebody who can do that, or you can just 
get a sense of studying the market and seeing what is working, then uh, that you're, you're going to come up with something that will work. Mm-hmm. And you're, yeah. not, you're not necessarily, I mean, I think people always want to come up with the best cover design ever kind of thing. Yeah. But that is, that's like, you know, writing a bestseller. It doesn't really happen that often. You have to be realistic. Um, and that sometimes you just have to get something that's good and doesn't let people down. Right. And doesn't put people off, you know. Right. Um, yeah. We all know those indie writers who do these covers that just put you off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I have a friend that just put out a book this uh, last week, and it's just doing great. But the cover is, fan- you know, for a romance, romantic comedy cover, it is fantastic. Mm. And so... In that case, the cover is working for her. Like it is, you know, people are one clicking for the cover, I think. And then they're getting this fabulous book on the back end. But I think you're right. Those are kind of lightning strikes. I just don't know that you always get that. Um, It just so happens that it's the right model, the right look, the right everything. And um, but the rest Mm -hmm. of us, we really kind of have to just go with go with what we know, the genre expectations and. And then hopefully we get a good cover in the process. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You you've got to go. Um, also, you know, you know your fan base, and you yeah. know uh, what makes them go ooh. Yeah, and you do kind of want to come up with something that makes them go ooh. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm I I want to read that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, what do you think is the biggest thing you've done to set yourself up for success? Mm, go for quality I would say yeah you know I really do aim for quality um I try to write quality Mm -hmm. you know like it's polished it's Mm -hmm. um edited uh and even then you know all the editing I do all the number of times I (laughs) read that there's still things that slip through (laughs) you just can't help that um but yeah, go for quality. Obviously, go for a good cover design. Mm-hmm. Um, try to make the book as professional and as polished as possible. Mm-hmm. And and I think if you stick to that mindset mm-hmm. that your books are going to be as good as, if not better than anybody, you know, other people, mm-hmm. um, then you really can't go wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, you have to, and also listen to people. If it's not working, if people, if everybody's saying to you, that cover is terrible. <laughs> I know. Which I've I seen know. this, um, come on, we've all seen this in writer groups when somebody right. posts their cover and everybody goes, oh, that cover's terrible. That cover's yes. not going to work. Right. And they, and they won't listen. Yeah. I know. I've had to get out of those groups. It makes mm-hmm. me a little nuts and crazy when <laughs> <Yeah>. people... <laughs> Yeah. On the other hand, there are some people you get new authors who come in. They'll say, "Hey, this is my cover," and we all go, "Wow!" Yeah, exactly. You I've it. seen that. I mean, even in genres that I don't read, somebody. I remember being in a group and somebody posted a fantasy cover, which just made me, you know, it's like, "Oh, that's an amazing cover." Yeah. I would buy this book, even though I don't read this kind of mm-hmm. this kind of book, mm-hmm. just because it's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the one click cover. That's a, oh, no. what we all want. <laughs> That's right. It's what yeah. we all want. Yeah. Mm. Well, where can people find out more about you? Uh, well, my my website is um, www.janestein.com, and that is J A N E S T E E N. And I know it sounds like James Dean if you say it. <laughs> you so do. That's why I always make sure I spell it out. Um, and otherwise, you know, you will find my books everywhere. Yes. Very good. Everywhere I can put them. Very good. In all well, formats I can, do, <laughs> I can provide. Them. However I can get them into your hands. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been great having you. I always love talking to you. So I'm so glad you took the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been yeah. a lot of fun talking to you. It has. Yeah, and we will have all the links at um, wishi'dknownthenpodcast.com. And we want to say thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. 
We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.